Hello and welcome to tonight's event, the socialist option in the British Columbia election. Before we start, I want to acknowledge the territories I am joining you from, which are the unceded, traditional and ancestral lands of the Hulkamilam and Squamish speaking peoples of the Coast Salish nations. The territory we call BC is home to 198 First Nations who continue to fight for the rights of self-determination and we want to express our full solidarity with this struggle. Indigenous peoples who are the caretakers to all of this land currently only have rights to 1% of it in this province. And the provincial and federal governments won't even respect that amount, as we've seen continued encroachment and attacks on nations such as the Wet'suwet'en and Sequimpec peoples in pipeline expansions. We believe this is a very serious injustice and our candidates today will speak more to this throughout the webinar. My name is Kayla Hillstaub and I will be moderating tonight's event. I'm a PhD student of communication at Simon Fraser University. I've also been a member of the Communist Party for the last seven years and been part of working class activism for over a decade. I'm glad to be here to help facilitate discussion with our candidates and I wanna thank you all for being here. We are in the midst of one of the worst economic and public health crises in modern history. This means unsafe working conditions, unemployment, homelessness, food insecurity, and increased gender and racial violence. Because we live in a capitalist system, we aren't all experiencing this equally, of course. Working people face these impacts. While the rich have benefited, getting richer, collecting massive government subsidies, and the gulf between the rich and the poor grows, meaning we, the working people, are much worse off than before. We believe that the people of British Columbia deserve better. Electing even one communist to the legislature would change the polit political climate entirely. A higher vote for communist candidates can send a powerful message to the wealthy that we reject the capitalist system, its endless accumulation and destruction, and we are here to fight for a better future. We can look to the electoral victory of the movement towards socialism in Bolivia last night, after Canada and the US supported a right-wing coup last year. Socialist ideas are resonating more and more around the world, and we are asking for your support. We are asking for your vote if you are in a position to do so. But we're also asking for you to get to know our party and to support the movement of socialism if these ideas resonate with you. Running candidates in this election is just one part of our work in fighting for a socialist future. We work to build grassroots working class power in movements across the province. We have four candidates who are well connected to their communities who will speak to this tonight, as well as what the Communist Party of BC stands for in this election. First, we have Ryan Abbott, the candidate for Surrey Wally. Ryan is an industrial painter and sandblaster, an active trade unionist, and a member of the Communist Party of BC. We also have Walt Parsons, where Walt is a truck driver, an engineering student. His studies have led him to co-op employment on multiple wind farms. He's been a member of the Communist Party for two years now and is running in the riding of Victoria Swan Lake. Kimball Curie was born on Treaty 6 territories in Saskatchewan, in, in, in Saskatoon, in a working class family of Métis and European settler origins. He is the communist candidate for Vancouver Hastings, where he lives in East Side, in East Vancouver, in a, in a housing co-op. Kimball is the retired editor of The People's Voice, a Vancouver-based socialist newspaper. Lastly, we have Tyson Strandland. Tyson is a Métis activist and UVic graduate student pursuing his master's at UVic in the History of Department's Cultural, Social, and Political Thought program as well as local Communist Party organizer in Victoria. He's running in Langford, Juan de Fuca. We also tonight have several community members here who are involved in movements and workplaces across the province, involved in education, gender equality, housing, and more. They will be asking questions to our candidates. We also welcome questions from everyone in attendance where you can put them in the chat and we can try to answer some of them after this portion of the event. We also ask everyone to please be respectful in the chat and we do have moderators to ensure it's a respectful space. After taking audience questions, each candidate will have two minutes of closing remarks and we will wrap up by launching a brief campaign video
created by some of our very talented volunteers. Let me now just briefly introduce our guests before we get started, um, who will be answering the questions. So first we have Rogine, who is a high school studies, uh, sorry, high school social studies teacher and active in her union, the British Columbia Teachers Federation, the BCTF. We have Jane Bowie, who is a former elected Vancouver School Board trustee and longtime activist for women's rights and gender equality. We also have Lillian, who is a labor and tenant advocate, elected member of the Vancouver Tenants Union Steering Committee and active in the Teaching Support Staff Union and BC Union Workers Union. We have Alejandra, a neuroscience master's student and researcher at the University of Victoria, Director of Communications in the UVic Neuroscience Graduate Student Association as well. We have Jan, um, who is a housekeeping worker in the healthcare sector, a recent member of the Hospital Employees Union, an advocate for gender equality and LGBT plus rights within the socialist movement. We have Roj, who is a support worker in Vancouver. She, she works with low barrier organizations that provide housing and support people experiencing homelessness, mental health struggles, and dependencies on substances. And finally, we have Alex, who's a Heltsuk and Niska farmer, or sorry, Niska fisherman and writer. Uh, he's been active in the solidarity with Wet'suwet'en struggle and has been fundraising for direct aid to Indigenous organizers, families, and Indigenous movements. So let's get to our questions. Um, I'll, uh, inter or I'll leave it to Rojin to ask the first question, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Rojin, and I'm a new high school social studies teacher. Thank you, Kayla, for your introduction. Um, this is actually only my second year teaching, and to be honest, I am quite burned out already. I love teaching and I love working with kids, and that's why I chose this profession. But our working conditions deserve to improve, especially if we want to ensure folks stay in this profession, which is very important to our society. As of now, on average, 50% of teachers quit and change professions within their first five years of teaching. And I personally believe this is a result of us being in an underfunded education system that leaves teachers overworked, underpaid, and underappreciated. Since the start of this new quarter system, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, I find that teachers' jobs, at least my job, has doubled, or in some cases tripled. Uh, for instance, we now have to fit an entire year's worth of material within only 10 weeks, and on top of that, have to do constant evaluations. Um, it is only October, and myself and so many of my colleagues are already burning out. In addition to added workload, class size has not changed, as our recent government refused to add more funding to make class sizes smaller, in order to implement better health and safety measures. Not only does a class size of around 30 kits make it practically impossible to physically distance, it is immensely difficult for teachers to pay attention to each student's learning needs and to do better and more justice for our students who truly deserve more. We need better funding for public education. Currently, BC puts some of the least funding for public education compared to other provinces. And when teachers demanded better funding during our most recent bargaining rounds, it was rejected by the current government. And as a result, tens of thousands of students across BC are not getting their educational needs met. And there is a critical and growing shortage of teachers in BC school districts, in part because we're simply not supported enough to, uh, to live sustainable lives under this profession. And so with all that said, my question is as follows. Is the Communist Party in support of increasing funding to public education, um, in particular, the annual per pupil funding, as well as the goal of decreasing class size to create better working conditions for teachers and a better educational environment for students. Why or why not? Thank you. Thank you, Rogine. So we're f we'll first, first go to Walt to answer this question. Hi, thank, thanks Rogine. And thanks for all that you're doing through all this, like obviously very important work that we depend on as a society. Education is is pivotal. Uh, we, I always feel that we stand on the shoulders of giants. We amass knowledge as a society as we go forward, and we need to put adequate resources into moving knowledge onto the next generation uh, of people. Um, this government has really failed to keep funding up as it should have, and as communists, we would 
raise uh, per student funding by $1,000 uh, to bring it in line with the Canadian average. Um, the, the, the increasing funds for school districts and employees will allow us to shrink class sizes by having more staff and, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, by having, by having more staff, we'll be able to shrink class sizes and really focus on addressing the educational needs of children in the province and doing the important work that needs to be done. Uh, furthermore, like shrinking class sizes should really be a no brainer, given that we're in a pandemic. And as you mentioned, having a class size full of 30 children makes it exceedingly difficult to social distance. So this should really be a much higher priority and we would address it with the seriousness that it deserves. Thank you, Walt. Let's go to Kimball for another answer. I think it's important to remember that this problem goes back for decades under the social credit governments, uh, then under the NDP during the 1990s. Yes, that's true. The Liberals made it worse after Gordon Campbell came in. Uh, they gave all the big tax breaks to the rich and the corporations, and they paid for that by slashing public services, including public education. Uh, the, the Liberals actually ripped up the teachers' contracts. Uh, that went to the courts after many years. Uh, they were uh, uh, told by the Supreme Court that this was illegal. That was the situation the NDP inherited. But instead of moving to, uh, to really properly fund public education, the NDP government under Education Minister uh, Rob Fleming has done the bare minimum to meet uh, uh, the ruling of the Supreme Court, not to really improve public education in this province. Uh, the NDP refuses to consider rolling back the big tax breaks that the Liberals gave uh, to the wealthy sections of society. They say they don't have the money to improve education. Of course the money is there. It's where it's been for the last 20 years in the bank accounts of the rich and the corporations. The NDP refuses to consider uh, taking back the money that governments spend on supporting elite private schools. Why is that? Why don't they simply stop funding those schools and put that money back into the education system where it belongs to help the teachers and students of this province? I'd like to see them do that. Uh, I don't think Mr. Minister Fleming has even uh, talked about that issue. Thank you, Kimball. I appreciate both your responses. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you to both Regine and Kimball for that. Um, let's move to our next topic. We have Jane who will be asking a question about childcare. There. Thanks so much for, the, for this opportunity to, uh, to ask a question. Um, as, as was said, I'm Jane Bowie, and I've spent most of my life working for women's rights, um, as well as the defense of public education. And uh, I, I worked on that, and part of what I did was ran for school board in Vancouver, and I was elected a school trustee and served one term as, a, as, as vice chair, in fact. But I want to address the issue of child care, and in BC, child care is extraordinarily expensive, amongst the most expensive in Canada, costing um, upwards of $1,000 a month. There's not enough licensed spaces and parents are forced to leave their children in unlicensed, possibly unsafe situations. And if they're lucky enough to find a, a childcare space for their kid, they are often in that position of simply working to pay for that childcare. On top of that, early child education childcare workers are amongst the poorest paid workers in the province. So I know that uh, childcare advocates, including early childhood care educators, have spent years developing a comprehensive childcare plan. It's now known commonly as the $10 a day plan. And the NDP, to their credit, have taken steps to begin implementing that plan. And studies by childcare advocates say that in fact, the situation in BC has improved since the last election. The NDP say they will fully implement the plan over the next decade. What is the communist party's position on the $10 a day plan and childcare in particular? Thank you, Jane, for this question. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna go to Kimball 
for the answer. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, well, the, the $10 a day plan, uh, it was developed by advocates for child care campaigners who worked for many years on this. It's a very well thought out, well developed and comprehensive plan uh, to make child care affordable and improved for, uh, for parents and families in this province. Uh, and we, uh, we do agree that the NDP has made some movement in this direction to begin to develop this plan. It's unfortunate that it's such a, a slow incremental approach. They talk about 10 years. Well, who knows what uh, things are gonna be like in 10 years. Uh, so we think that this plan should be implemented much more quickly. Uh, they should stop subsidizing the for-profit childcare system. We say that public funds should go to support public and community run child care centers. It was the liberals that welcomed big box child care into this province and we should be working to change that situation uh, uh, to get rid of the, uh, the big box child care approach. And that's something that the communist party has said for many years. We have a long history of fighting for quality, accessible, universal child care. It's always been one of our top priorities going back nearly a hundred years. We know that universal child care is connected to women's ability to fully participate in the workforce, uh, uh, to gain full equality, to overcome the barriers of the patriarchal system that our society suffers under. This is an absolutely crucial tool for creating a better society. And again, we can afford it. The, the, the BC uh, budget for 2020 allocated $88 million for childcare, according to the $10 a day campaign. That sounds like a lot of money, but when you compare it to the 3 billion in tax breaks uh, that the rich and the corporations are still benefiting from 20 years after Gordon Campbell gave it to them, why is it that some of that money can't be clawed back and put into childcare, public education, healthcare, you know, the things that we all really need. I'd like to challenge the NDP on this because I don't think on this basis, they've really earned our support. Thank you, Kimball. And thank you, Jane, for the question. We're gonna to move to our next topic, which is labor and workers' rights. And we have a question from Sana, who is a Unite Here organizer. However, she couldn't be here today because of work. So I'm gonna read this question on her behalf. So Sana wants to know, most employers and big corporations are seeing this pandemic as an opportunity to mass terminate the workers and renegotiate their rights. In hugely affected industries such as tourism, Workers don't have enough leverage to fight back and won't be able to go back to work anytime soon, mainly because broader of broader closure. How would you protect union and non-union workers during this time? We're first gonna to go to Ryan for this question. Hey, Kayla, thanks for passing that question along from Santa. Um, you know, I can speak from personal experience. I lost probably a month and a half of work this year because of COVID. And, uh, you know, to some degree, I can understand what's going on with with uh, with this struggle. I know a lot of people have been out of work for a long time, living, you know, you know, waiting for the CERB check to come in and, and trying to make it on, on the bare minimum. Um, so I know this is, this is a huge crisis. It's a huge economic crisis for working people. Um, and I mean, what did the federal government do? They gave us the, the, the Canada emergency wage subsidy, which is basically, you know, subsidizing employers um, to pay, pay them money for the, the wages to help cover that. But I mean, you know, that was abused and it continues to be abused. Uh, and at a federal level, I mean, the NDP supported that through and through. So, I mean, um, it's, re it's really no different than, than what the, the NDP is doing here, sort of just hoping, you know, this class collaborationist uh, sort of politics can kind of win people over. But really, like, people are in, in a desperate situation here with uh, layoffs. Uh, I know the Local 40 with the hotel workers who have waged, you know, some tremendous labor struggles here in Vancouver. Um, I think one of the longest strikes 
on the books here in Vancouver a few months ago uh, to get a, a decent contract. As soon as they got that contract, what happens? COVID comes in uh, and the employers, all these you know massive multinational hotels use this as an excuse to just lay off all these unionized workers. You know, the, with all their hard fought, you know, contracts, um, all their good wages that they won through that long campaign, uh, suddenly they're thrown right back into the fire. And it's it's immensely frustrating to watch these workers, uh, you know, petition the NDP, you know, at a provincial level saying we need, you know, recall back to our jobs. They're going to bring in scabs and they're going to take our jobs and uh, we're going to lose you know, all this, all this stuff that we fought for, the NDP just sits there and sits there and sits there and says, you know, this is an employee, uh, employer uh, conflict, we can't get involved. Um, we don't want to take sides. Um, it's, it's unbelievable, you know, the sort of tone deaf uh, politics coming from the provincial government. Uh, when you see these people come to the rallies, to the strikes just a few months ago, and campaigning and taking photos with these hotel workers uh, just a, a couple months later, just to close the door on them. And while these workers are out on the, the front lawn of legislature uh, demanding you know, recall rights to their jobs, basically the NDP is just saying, oh no, we don't know who you are or what you want. And uh, basically this is your problem. Um, this is unacceptable. This is a huge loss for union jobs in this province, uh, in the hospitality industry, and the Communist Party is demanding 100% recall rights and wage protections uh, for all laid off workers um, due to COVID. Um, we're also calling for full labor standards being extended to all domestic, uh, agricultural workers and migrant workers. Um, and we're also calling for an immediate uh, $20 an hour minimum wage. This is the kind of stuff that we need right now for working people to restart the economy, to get money back in people's pockets and get people back to work. And that's uh, that's where we stand. But uh, thank you for the question. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, next, we're going to go to Walt for this question. Yeah, thank, thanks again, Ryan, for, for your comments. Um, I would like to add to uh, to this beyond, well, it is the Communist Party intent to to nationalize the energy and resource sectors. And, and in doing so, we would take out the exploitation present in it and we would be able to really give workers the full value of their labor. Uh, this this goes much further than just unionization. Like workers would would really be able to emancipate themselves by fully getting the value of their work. Um, <sighs> Yeah, the national yeah uh, nationalizing resource and energy is uh, a, an essential way to employ thou tens of thousands of individuals with really good paying jobs. These uh, we currently British Columbia and Canada in general tend to be a bit of a resource colony uh, the way that they're currently operated, and a lot of money goes to the pockets of multinational corporations and end up in bank accounts in the Cayman Islands and the like. When we take control of these enterprises, we'll be able to keep money in the pockets of British Columbians and in the coffers of the province so that we can invest uh, in the livelihood of individuals that live and work in the province um, and really ensure that they don't have to, to worry uh, about where their next job might be after the pandemic. Thank you, Walt, and thank you uh, to Santa for the question, who unfortunately couldn't be here. Um, so with that, we're going to move to our next topic, which is Indigenous rights, and I'll call on Alex to please uh, ask this question. Hi, thank you. Um, so for my whole life, my grandpa always told me to vote NDP, and the first election I did but the second election, I was jaded and I was disappointed and all I had seen was broken promises. And historically, that's what I was told was that the NDP was supposed to be really progressive, but that's not what I've seen in my lifetime. Um, I've seen them turn their back on what's Odin. I've turned them, I've seen them do a, a 180 on oil. 
uh, every different time it comes to prioritizing the rights and needs of indigenous people, industry wins. Industry is prioritized by this colonial government every time. And I was just wondering what the Communist Party would do differently as opposed to the NDP or the liberals or the conservatives as they've historically done to us. Thank you, Alex, for the question. Let's first go to Tyson for an answer. Yes, thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, I hear a lot of questions about our policies regarding Indigenous rights here in Canada and in BC and why the Communist Party would do anything differently than, than one of the bourgeois capitalist parties. The NDP has certainly talked big on Indigenous rights, but the reality is something else altogether, as you've rightly stated, Alex. And Indigenous rights, it seems, are, are just a cynical and, and hollow talking uh, talking point for pseudo-progressive rhetoric. Uh, and in fact, actually, at a debate just the other night, which uh, John Horgan didn't even show up to, he, he had Mitzi Dean uh, let us all know that uh, Horgan apparently has a personal elder who prays for him every night in what I could only describe as a nauseating display of tokenism. Uh, the NDP's continued attacks on Indigenous sovereignty are abhorrent and, and should be condemned in the strongest terms, there's no question. Uh, of course, the Liberals don't even pretend to care about Indigenous peoples, and the Greens uh, also leave a lot to be desired, uh, to say the least. All of these representing at best paternalistic and at worst hostile racist policies which, which actively endanger Indigenous peoples. Now, I, I, of course, I could in, uh, spend uh, my entire time here, several times over, in fact, just listing their crimes. But uh, what's important to emphasize, as you mentioned, is, is I think our very straightforward policy, which can be summarized in a few words. Sovereignty, justice, and ultimately the rights to self-determination for Indigenous peoples. The UN was founded on the principle of self-determination of nations, a right which is denied, meanwhile, uh, to Indigenous nations here in Canada. Indigenous nations are nations and deserve to be treated as such. For our party, that means complete recognition of inherent Indigenous title to all traditional territories. Stopping all violations of Bill 41, the Declaration on Indigenous Peoples Act, as well as a halt to all resource extraction projects on Indigenous territories without full consultation and approval. Thanks. Thank you, Tyson, for that answer. And secondly, let's go to Kimball. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to, to add some more to that. Uh, in my experience, you judge people, you judge political parties, not by their campaign promises. You judge by what they do year in, year out, uh, whether they're in power or not. Uh, you judge them by their attitude to uh, the real needs of working class people, wherever they are, uh, you judge them by how they respond to the oppressive acts of the ruling class. Uh, uh, if you go back in the history of our party, we've been around almost 100 years. We'll be celebrating our 100th anniversary next year. We were the first political party in this country to say, no, we've got this entirely wrong. Uh, you know, we were a party originally founded mostly on the basis of uh, various immigrant communities, English, East, East European, Finnish, and so on. Uh, we were not from the, the original Anglo ruling class. Uh, uh, after we were formed, uh, not long after, about 10 years after, our leader Tim Buck was thrown in jail for sedition, supposedly, along with a lot of our other leaders. When Tim Buck was on trial, he gave the first really comprehensive statement on our attitude to the oppression of Indigenous peoples in this country. He said it right from the dock when he was being tried and sentenced to, to several years in jail. He said that Canada was the land that was founded on two things. Number one, on the theft of the lands and resources of the original inhabitants. And then on the exploitation of immigrant labor. 
he put it uh, in an intersectional way, we'd say today, that there was this intersection of colonialism and capitalism that was crushing the people of this country, the working class people, the indigenous peoples. And Tim Buck's viewpoint was what we brought into the labor and people's movements everywhere across the country in, in the decades that followed. And you can see you know, the bound volumes of our newspaper that are here in the office where I'm speaking from, have article after article condemning uh, the, the theft of indigenous lands, the violations of the treaties. Not many people know, but those treaties are, they were not you know, uh, instruments for the surrender of indigenous territories. The numbered treaties on the prairies, for example, these were treaties in which the indigenous peoples agreed to allow the settlers to share the use of that land to the depth of the tip of a plow. It was never intended to surrender all those lands to the Canadian capitalist state. They didn't do that. There's some, uh, some early interesting examples of communist organizing among indigenous peoples. The one that uh, uh, is my personal uh, favorite because it resonates with the Métis side of my family. It was during the 1930s and 40s. There were movements led by our comrades Jim Brady and Malcolm Norris, uh, the Métis patriots of, of that period, and they struggled for a Métis land base in Western Canada after the events of 1885, and uh, particularly uh, a successful struggle to set up Métis uh, land bases in a number of places across Alberta. An outstanding people's struggle that had the support of the trade unions and other groups of that time. We have the example of the, the communists in the United Fishermen's Union on the West Coast, Homer Stevens and his comrades, uh, who played a major role in helping to organize indig Indigenous fishermen, uh, some of them into the UFAWU, uh, but also to build cooperation with the Native Brotherhood, which represents the, the bulk of the, the native fishermen of that period of time. Uh, over the years, we've had a lot of uh, uh, examples of communists engaged in solidarity struggles with indigenous movements. Uh, it goes back to, for example, Oka in 1990, uh, where I was one of the people deeply involved in that solidarity movement in Regina. You know, from there to Caledonia, the, the land back lane struggle in Ontario today. Uh, the Wet'suwet'en solidarity movements across the country. We were out there in the streets helping to, uh, to build solidarity with that resistance against pipelines. Uh, struggles with the Mi'kmaq fisher, lobster fishermen on, on the Atlantic coast. You can go to our website and see the articles by participants who are building solidarity actions Right now, there's going to be one in Nova Scotia tomorrow, led by one of our prominent comrades from, uh, from that part of the country. So we have a, a very proud, solid 90-year history in this regard. Maybe not always the, the most up-to-date academic language, I'll admit that, but we have been in the right place, the right time, every time. Thank you so much for that, for the work that both of you do. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Alex, for that question and to Tyson and Kimball for those answers. With that, let's move to Roj, who will be asking a question related to the opi opioid crisis in British Columbia. Hi, everyone. My name is Roj, and I'm a support worker in Vancouver. As many of us are aware, we're currently amidst a dual health crisis with the global pandemic, as well as the opioid crisis, which is particularly uh, prevalent here in the Lower Mainland. The numbers truly speak for themselves here as over a thousand overdose related deaths have been reported so far in 2020, which tremendously surpass all other uh, causes of non-natural death combined. So while overdose and overdose related deaths have been a long-standing issue, in 2016, the rise of fentanyl kickstarted a new era of fatality as it contaminated even non-opioid drugs, oftentimes without the knowledge of the people consuming the drugs. COVID-19 has also exacerbated this crisis as more people are forced to use alone and have limited access to support networks that monitor safety. Addressing this crisis means a lot to me as I work with the communities who are severely affected, but also because I know that all sorts of people use drugs and are dependent on drugs, even if their use is not visible and they don't fit into a stereotypical profile of a substance dependent person. 
I myself have lost people because of this crisis, and I'm certain that most of us have people in our communities who use drugs to greater or lesser degrees, whether we're aware of it or not. And uh, the stigma associated with the subject pushes people further into the fringes and into isolation, uh, where they're especially vulnerable, vulnerable at this time, which makes genuine outreach and support even more difficult. So all of that being said, my question is, how does what does harm reduction mean to you and how are harm reduction strategies effective in saving lives, especially in this opioid crisis that we're currently facing? So thank you so much for that very thoughtful question, Roj. Um, of course, this, this uh, subject in particular, I think is, is a very difficult one for a lot of people in BC who have been directly or indirectly affected uh, by the opioid crisis. You know, which has led to, to the needless deaths of, of over a thousand people already this year, as you said. Uh, I myself have lost a family member to drug overdose. Uh, and, and you know, it's, it's tragic to think that, that this problem is getting worse rather than better. Uh, for myself and members of the Communist Party, harm reduction is about more than just mitigating damage as it happens. It's about actually preventing the circumstances which lead to opioid-related deaths in the first place. That includes uh, guaranteeing low-income housing uh, be available for everyone, uh, which contrary to popular imagination would actually vastly reduce the social uh, and health costs associated with homelessness. Dr. Norman Bethune, an early fighter for socialized health care in Canada and uh, a member of our party, had a deep understanding of an interest in the, the social roots of sickness. And today the Communist Party carries on that compassionate legacy in promoting policies that reflect that addiction is frequently the result of poverty and not the reverse. But as you mentioned, it's, it's not something that uh, strictly affects people who, who uh, are in poverty either. And there's many, many people we may know in our lives who, who we could have no idea are affected by drug addiction. It, it, it uh, has a, a wide cross section of the population who, who are affected. Um, but that said, uh, you know, people who are suffering from addiction need help, need support, not punishment and criminalization. We're fighting for the expansion of mental health services and long-term recovery support programs to help people who are suffering right now. Here in Victoria, despite the negative response from some segments of the community, needle exchanges and safe injection sites are an example of programs that can and have saved lives. The war on drugs has been a complete disaster, on the other hand, and, and BC urgently needs the establishment of a permanent, safe, and regulated supply of drugs that's made available province-wide. Your question was about harm reduction, and this is a term frequently heard in capitalist countries, uh, but under socialism, I believe we can actually solve these problems altogether. Under socialism, it's possible to work not towards, not just towards harm reduction, but harm elimination in many cases. And, and I think this is one such example. Thank you. Thank you to Rose for the question and thank you to Tyson for answering. So with that, let's move on to our next topic, which is housing. And I'd like to call on Lillian to ask this question. Hi everyone, thanks, thanks uh, for having me. Um, so my question is about housing. Um, so uh, the BC government has boasted that only 15% of BC's 600,000 600, renting uh, households weren't able to pay rent in full during the declared state of emergency due to COVID-19, which was between March 18 and August 17 of this year. That's still 90,000 households that are now being forced to pay their outstanding rent by July 10, 2021, or else be evicted. How are these renters supposed to pay more than their monthly rent when they have been, when many have been out of work since March? In August, 2020, the Vancouver Tenants Union sent out a survey to renters. Of the 400 respondents, 28% reported going hungry or skipping meals to pay rent since COVID-19 began. 69% of those who had accrued rent debt were worried about being able to begin repaying it starting October 2020. The 32% of rent of respondents reported they were at risk of falling into rent debt once governmental supports like the Canada Emergency Response Benefit 
and the temporary rental supplement ended, which um, as of October 3rd, both of these are now have now ended. Further, 63% of all respondents reported experiencing new or worsening health, mental health uh, around their rent and rent debt situations. The BC government has not done nearly enough to support renters in the best of times, but especially because through COVID-19. At the last general membership meeting of the Vancouver Tenants Union, we passed a motion asking that political parties include and enact the following protections. Vacancy control for all renters, collective bargaining rights for all renters, to reinstate the eviction ban for the remainder of the pandemic, to continue the rent freeze on rent on rental increases for the remainder of the pandemic, to cancel or forgive all rent debts accrued during the pandemic, and among other things um, that were focused on the rights of unhoused people in Vancouver specifically. Which of these protect protections does the Communist Party support? And what can the party do to support our organizations and co coalitions coming together to push for these protections? Thank you, Lillian. Let's first move to Tyson for this question. <clears throat> Thank you, Lillian, for the question. Much appreciated. Uh, I'd like to start by, by mentioning that uh, in the context of this blatantly undemocratic snap election, the Communist Party had to get its platform out on extremely short notice. Some of the policies you've listed are listed in our platform, including the ban on ev evictions and strict rent controls. But I can guarantee you there's not a single policy you've listed that both myself and members of my party don't support to the hilt. What I think is vital is the essence of our program in that it aims to put working people and tenants rather than corporations and landlords in control. While the statistics you listed were for Vancouver, uh, Vancouver Island, particularly the greater Victoria area where myself, Walt and uh, Florian Castle who couldn't be here this evening are running, uh, is going through a severe housing crisis as well. Not just one of the worst in the province, uh, but in Canada for that matter. Two thirds of the population here are, are renters. Uh, so if people are struggling to pay their rent, then that's a serious problem. Early in the pandemic, John Horgan offered a, a landlord supplement of $500 per unit that ensured both individual and corporate landlords would have the cash uh, continue to flow and from them to the banks, uh, regardless of the conditions for working people who, who needed food on their plates. And despite the fact that the federal government had already made billions available to the banks and corporations. Our party certainly doesn't see that as any sort of solution, short or long term. On the contrary, members of the Communist Party view housing as a fundamental right, especially in a province like BC, where there's absolutely the material foundations necessary to guarantee that everyone has a roof over their heads. That's why our party is calling for 100,000 units of new and renovated social, uh, low income social housing to put an end not only to homelessness, but to housing precarity altogether. When uh, combined with a series of other measures like rent controls uh, and a ban on such abhorrent landlord practices as rent evictions and dem evictions uh, and additional policies like the ones you mentioned. Meaningful tenant representation is one in particular, which I think is long overdue. When tenancy boards are stacked with landlords, well, I have firsthand experience dealing with these institutions and frankly, it's, it's a bit of a waste of time as surely anyone could guess it would be. So often it seems the tenancy boards are there not to protect tenants, but landlords. So fixing this needs to be a major priority and ensuring tenants occupy positions on these boards rather than landlords, I think is, uh, would be a major first step. Thanks, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for that, Tyson. Let's move to Ryan to also comment on this. Hey, Lillian, thanks uh, for the question and thanks for all your hard work with the VTU. Uh, everyone at the party admires the work that uh, the VTU does for tenants in Vancouver and uh, we hope that they're able to continue to expand um, that work into the greater metro area. Um, I mean, so speaking from personal experience, I mean, when 
uh, I lost my job, I lost my ability to pay rent. And so basically, um, yeah, I, I felt the I felt the squeeze firsthand with, uh, with the situation of not being able to pay rent and waiting anxiously to hear announcements about what sort of supports are gonna come from the federal government, what's gonna come from the provincial government. Um, and so, I mean, well, well, all this was going on. I mean, uh, we had the NDP, I think had one of the slowest responses to uh, the crisis, uh, to the tenant, to tenant issues um, during COVID. And, and I mean, we had like Doug Ford in Ontario uh, banning evictions during the pandemic. We had Donald Trump in the United States banning evictions during the pandemic. Uh, all the while, the NDP is just sort of like waiting for the federal government to do something uh, when all these people are on the verge of losing their housing just as they lost their jobs. So, I mean, it was experiencing this personally, it, it was disgusting what Selena Robinson and uh, Spencer Chandra H Herbert were doing. It was just like, it's they're trying to, you know, do the same thing they do with labor rights is they try and address uh, tenants and landlords on the same sort of platform. They try and address workers and employees as their sort of equals. It's like, uh, basically it was, a, it was a frustrating experience for me. Um, and I don't know how I would have dealt with it if I wouldn't have gotten back to work right away. Um, basically, well, the NDP was, was uh, not, not willing to take decisive action on this issue. Members of my party were at the front lines of working alongside the VTU, starting tenants associations um, and doing on the ground organizing. So, I mean, uh, basically the NDP put forward stuff like uh, a subsidy on, for the landlords on top of uh, CERB, basically taking taxpayer dollars and, and shifting that money from working people into subsidizing a housing market that's already one of the largest housing bubbles you know on the planet and so what does this do economically it 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 continues to build the bubble it continues to transfer wealth from working people up into you know uh, multinational corporations that are investing in housing as, as if it's some sort of game and basically now we have all these uh, all these people that are basically forced to live on their credit cards, they're in debt, they don't have jobs, uh, they're facing evictions from their landlords, and all the while the NDP, all they've managed to do is prop up the housing bubble. So when that crashes, there literally is no, there is no way out of this, you know, conventionally through, through the solutions that uh, bourgeois politicians have. Um, and so, for me, this really highlights the need, you know, above even political platforms, the need for tenants uh, to be forming tenants unions. Um, you know, we need, as tenants, we need the, the right to bargain collectively. Just as like, if you've got a, a worker and you've got a union, uh, you can, you know, you can go head to head with your boss and you can sort of negotiate a contract. The same thing needs to happen with tenants is they need to have a provincially mandated right to negotiate, you know, as a collective building, as a collective neighborhood against their landlord to say, listen, you know, every year you raise my rent. Uh, you know what? All of us have had enough of that. And we're tired of the rent increases. We're tired of the dem evictions. We're tired of the rent evictions. Uh, basically enough's enough. Tenants need to organize. Um, and this Communist Party is calling for, you know, stricter rent controls, uh, abolishing rent evictions and dam evictions, um, alongside, you know, the other stuff that Tyson said about building 100,000 units of social housing, you know, to take the pressure off of renters in this, you know, ridiculously overpriced market. Thanks, everyone. Thank you to Lillian for the question and to both Tyson and Ryan for your answers. So let's move to our next topic, which is environmental issues and pipelines. And with that, I will call on Alejandra to please ask this question. 
Hello. And thank you all who worked together tonight to facilitate this event tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I will be asking this question on behalf of a member of the party who unfortunately cannot attend the session tonight. But as a scientist myself, I appreciate the importance of bringing up environmental issues. Many of us are familiar with the evidence on how um, continued use and expansion of fossil fuel industries can have seriously deleterious effects and the environmental consequences. On top of this, many of these projects in our province involve indigenous territories. Considering all of this, the question that I want to present to the candidates today is, what is your opinion on the continued expansion of fossil fuel projects in British Columbia? Is it possible to build these projects and pipelines without inflicting serious environmental damage and also without violating indigenous rights? And if not, what would the alternative be? Thank you. Thank you, Alejandra. I'll ask Ryan to please um, answer this one. Sure. Uh, thanks for the question, Alejandra. Um, yeah, so I mean, full disclosure, I work as an industrial painter and a sandblaster. I get probably 20% of my income uh, from the oil and gas industry. Um, and that's a fact. And that's an economic reality. And that's the economic reality of you know, tens of thousands of people in this province. Um, I was raised in Alberta, out in oil country. Um, it's a whole culture, it's a whole, you know, sector of the economy. Um, but, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't override uh, realities such as the history of colonialization in Canada. Uh, that doesn't override realities of the fact that we've got eight years to take drastic, uh, drastic measures to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. Um, and so it's, yeah, fossil fuel projects. I know it's a heated, heated subject. It's a heated subject in my industry. Um, but I mean, we need to think, you know, to the future and we need to think about um, whose land these projects are being built on. And we need to think about the fact that climate change um, it's not, it's not something that's going to happen a, a century from now. It's not going to happen, you know, a thousand years from now. It's happening, you know, right now. It's happening in the next 10 years. It's happening in the next 20 years. And I mean, we can't, we can't afford to be, you know, investing money in the tar sands anymore. That's a project that needs to be shut down. Um, fracking, we can't afford to be fracking. That's, you know, a project that needs to be shut down. Um, I'm running in a riding in Surrey Wally. Uh, I'm running against, what's he called? The Minister of Energy, Mining and Petroleum. So, I mean, he's a British guy, his name's Bruce Ralston. Uh, wasn't content enough to, you know, colonize this country once. He's got to do it again. Um, and the NDP has been more than willing to to collaborate on the Trans Mountain Pipeline, even though they said they wouldn't. Um, they do cynical stuff like enacting the United Nations uh, Decla Declaration on uh, the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And then, you know, not even a month later, they're sending in armed SWAT teams against Swiss'uitan people up in Northern BC. It's uh, to get the CGL pipeline through. So, I mean, this province, province has deep issues with uh, indigenous rights, indigenous sovereignty, uh, and promoting carbon intensive projects that we can't afford to be doing. Well, the NDP was uh, trying to get past, you know, the, the solidarity lines at the legislature and all these, you know, scab politicians in the NDP were jumping over people and trying to jump over, you know, stairways so they could get into legislature and continue acting as if it's business as normal. Well, all these indigenous youth were blocking, uh, blocking legislature. My party was active on the front lines. We were providing support to blockades. We were, uh, I know the comrades in Victoria were there day at night at the legislature and in Vancouver, we were doing the same thing. Um, so, I mean, we have, you know, two different sort of ways of looking at indigenous rights here and the NDP has just proved themselves incapable 
of uh, of act taking decisive action on on this issue. And I mean, they're they'll they'll be the party remembered in this country as the ones who basically ended the reconciliation process that came out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And Bruce Ralston and John Horgan, their names will all be remembered when you know the sea levels are rising and Van Vancouver's wiped off the map. So, um, you know, in terms of indigenous rights, we can't afford these projects. In terms of the environment, we have very short time to change our economy so that we're not focused on this ridiculous carbon intensive stuff anymore. Um, and we need to be pushing for alternatives. We need, you know, mass transit. Everybody likes to jump on the anti-China bandwagon. Um, but I mean, their transit system is bar none the best in the world. They can move a billion people a year on high speed trains. And here we have, I've, I've experienced this personally, living in Abbotsford, driving to North Vancouver for a 12 hour shift, spending four hours in the car every day. There is no reason why we shouldn't have good transit throughout the lower mainland here. There's no reason why we shouldn't have uh, mass housing and why we can't invest in, in construction and building you know, low income housing um, and getting people off the streets. There's no reason why we can't abandon our, you know, NAFTA, which is a ridiculous economic agreement that we have with the United States and why we don't rebuild our manufacturing uh, sector here in BC. You know, we can work on green energy projects. There's so much we could do. Um, we need to stop subsidizing oil and gas and, you know, we need to move on with the program. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Ryan. And now I'll call on Tyson to also address this question, please. <clears throat> Certainly. Uh, and thank you, Ryan, for your own very strong answer. I appreciate your comments. And thanks, Alejandra, for this question. Uh, this, this subject in particular uh, is quite near uh, to my heart and is one of the reasons I, I actually first became involved with the Communist Party many years ago. Uh, I remember when I was, uh, I first started in, in uh, post-secondary and I was uh, studying environmental technology and uh, I'll never forget the day I, I stood up and I left my class and, and I, I just I realized there was no point in being there I thought you know that uh, I thought that you know, more more scientists were needed to solve this question but ultimately the the question of you know uh, protecting our environment and and its destruction is a is a question is a political question it's a social question uh, the science has been out on, on these issues for a very very long time uh, so, I mean, that said, I mean, one, one hardly needs to be uh, an expert in environmental science uh, to understand that, that the very obvious question, uh, answer to your question is, is a resounding no, that you, you cannot continue these projects, which are known to have catastrophic uh, direct and indirect consequences for our planet, you know, such as, as CO2, increased CO2 emissions, uh, you know, horrible destruction, uh, the far less talked about, but no less serious ocean acidification. Uh, and I mean, certainly uh, here on the BC coast, uh, we're looking at increased uh, oil tra tanker traffic uh, and, and, you know, the, the inevitable accidents that are, are associated with that on sea. Uh, are, and meanwhile, uh, accidents on land from, from pipelines, which uh, seem to, to leak and burst uh, at every opportunity. Now, our party is firmly against any additional resource extraction or energy projects on indigenous territories, as Ryan mentioned, without full consultation and approval. And I think this is, is not only an important, but an essential aspect of our environmental strategy. Indigenous peoples share a deep connection with the land, which, which derives from thousands of years of living here in harmony with the environment, sustainably managing resources, while at the same time providing for their societies in abundance. You know, today that, that relationship has been disrupted and is threatened by capitalism and imperialism. In an all candidates meeting the other night, Gord Baird from the, Communi uh, from the, sorry, from the Green Party uh, said that the problem is that we haven't put a dollar sign on everything yet. That we haven't put a price on clean air, on wildlife, etc. Uh, <laughs> I think that's absolutely crazy. 
uh, you know, if the green environmental strategy is to commodify the entire planet, I think someone needs to break it to them that, well, that's precisely what capitalism has, has already done. And moreover, it's, uh, it's what got us into this mess to begin with. The commodification of nature is completely uh, at odds, both with indigenous and with Marxist principles. Our party calls for collective and democratic ownership and control over resources and energy to ensure that we can develop green, sustainable energy while suspecting indigenous sovereignty. A resource and energy plan that guarantees a clean environment, well-paid green jobs for the working class, and not just a quick source of profit for transnational corporations. And again, I think this is really a, a vital part of, of a seriously different philosophy uh, that distinguishes our party from the, the bourgeois capitalist parties that promote this, this devastating for-profit uh, commodification of, of our planet. Thanks. Thank you, Tyson. And thank you, Ryan, for your responses. And also thank you to Alejandro who posed this question. Let's move to our final question for this part of the talk before we get into uh, some of the audience questions. So with this, I'm gonna call on Jan, who's going to ask a two-part question about gender and LGBTQ plus equality. So take it away, Jan, with the first part of the question. Thank you, Kayla. Um, this COVID-19 pandemic and the subsequent economic crunch uh, has put a great strain on our healthcare system. And this has taken a disproportionate toll on many marginalized groups. Uh, for instance, uh, my community, the LGBT plus slash two-spirit community, who are already struggling against the social inequalities in the healthcare system. Issues like lack of resources and funding for mental health care, long wait times for medical procedures, and shortage of access to doctors have all worsened with the increased pressure on our fragile medical system. Many trans-affirming surgeries have been put on hold for the foreseeable future. As our capitalist economy falls into economic depression, people are worried that the ruling class will respond with austerity measures and cuts to health care and social care. These cuts often first occur in areas which are deemed non-essential, but are so important for an already marginalized and impoverished community, such as the trans community. Does the Communist Party consider trans health care as essential? How would you respond to these issues? Thank you, Jan, and I'll call on Walt to please respond to this one. Thank you for the question there, Jan. This one is, is pretty close to home. A very dear comrade of mine is undergoing transition and they actually waited until they left British Columbia to make the transition due to the, the wait times and the lack of resources available. Um, the Communist Party holds very clearly that trans rights are human rights. And just just as valid as every other human right. Um, a, a lack of funds and urgency in the medical system pertaining to, to gender affirming surgeries has has like a real human and social cost. Uh, like we know that there's obviously issues of of suicide and self harm for individuals that that are need need these surgeries that desperately want these procedures and are sitting around waiting for them particularly with all of the other issues uh, in the world today, like this, that's a mental health crisis that, that nobody needs. Like, let's, let's really, let's really like move forward with a solution that, that uh, so that trans folk uh, feel, feel comfortable and, and full in, in themselves, that they can self-actualize and be comfortable and give back to the community that they live in. Um, I'm not sure how much else I have to add, but trans comrades are comrades. Thanks. Thank you, Walt. And I'll call on Jan again to please uh, answer, or ask the second part of your question. Uh, yeah. Oh. Sorry. Sorry, hang on. Um, so, Thank you, Kayla, uh, and thank you, Walt, for the fantastic answer. Um, during these times of capitalist crisis, 
we have seen a rise in fascistic violence, uh, scapegoating, misogyny, rape. Uh, how would you respond to this latest wave of reactionary outrage? Jan, I think we may have lost your sound for a moment. Um, would you mind maybe repeating part of the question? Oh, no. <laughs> maybe just this, um, reread the second half. All right, I'm back. Um, so in recent years, we've seen a, a rise in reactionary violence against the LGBTQ community. Uh, so how does the Communist Party respond to this recent rise in uh, fascistic violence and reactionary outrage? Thank you. Uh, let me call on Kimball to address this question. Yeah, uh, thanks very much for the question, Jan. A very critical question in this you know, terrible day and age when, as you say, uh, this type of violence, uh, uh, scapegoating, all of it is is on the rise, and we're seeing, in particular, a lot of uh, uh, threats and violence directed against the trans community. Uh, my uh, my answer would be, I'm trying to keep it short, in in two parts. Uh, you know, I was proud to be in the room when the Communist Party first addressed this issue back uh, some 25 years ago, uh, when we first realized that we had to uh, give some serious attention to, to questions uh, uh, you know, of transphobia, uh, attacks against the gay community and so forth. And we adopted a very forward-looking, inclusive policy at that time. And we stick to that to this day. We're a very inclusive party in terms of our uh, our theoretical approach, our practical approach. Uh, the only way to respond to these kind of attacks uh, is to resist them at every level uh, by reaching out to people who need to be educated among our families, our friends, our co-workers, never giving up on trying to help people understand what the issues at stake are, uh, never giving up on uh, resisting the, the negative ideas, the hate-filled ideas of, of patriarchy and misogyny that are behind a lot of these types of violence. Uh, and we also uh, do our best to mobilize our members and our friends when it comes time to stand up against particular examples of this being in, inflicted on our streets. Uh, things like attempts to bring transphobic speakers uh, into public spaces like our library system. We are opposed to using public spaces to spread hatred, whether it's against uh, any part of the LGBTQ plus community or, or any other section of society. Uh, you know, so we, we stand in solidarity because that's what the working class does. We all have to stand together uh, to resist attempts to divide us. And this particular kind of divisive attempt is really on the rise, not just in Canada today, but unfortunately in many other countries as well. Thanks, Kimball, and thank you, Jan, for those great questions, and Walt as well for your answer. So um, we are at the point of the event now where we have um, asked all of our uh, questions from our guests and community members, and we've uh, seen some really great questions in the YouTube chat, and so we want to draw on some of these questions. Um, and so as a segue from our last uh, questions that were asked, I'm gonna ask the one, um, has the party learned any lessons from the collapse of the equal socialists and the infiltration of reactionary ideology into their leadership? And Kimball, I'll ask you to speak to that one um, again, please. Yeah, thanks Kayla. Uh, I've known some of the people from the eco socialists for a long time. Uh, in some ways, I wasn't surprised at what happened. Uh, and it was very sad in some ways. A lot of people were looking forward to having a, a socialist party on the ballot that could do things like go after the government about the Site C Dam and the other examples of uh, the government uh, expanding carbon emissions instead of tackling them from a socialist perspective. But unfortunately, as uh, uh, the question says, 
Uh, there were some elements of the eco-socialists that you don't want to go into too much detail, but some of them seem to have bought into the uh, uh, so-called radical feminist line, uh, a very uh, backward looking, I would say, understanding of, uh, of gender uh, in our society. Uh, and they became brought into you know, the orbit of some of those who are trans exclusive, sex worker exclusive, so-called radicals. Uh, and regardless of what the overall balance of forces in the eco-socialist was around these issues, uh, this was something that immediately, you know, when it became an issue in their leadership, the whole party imploded. Uh, I think they should have been much more careful about how they were going to address these questions and uh, uh, they should have done more to resist the penetration uh, of these very divisive, uh, abusive kinds of ideologies into their party. They paid a, a pretty heavy price for it. Uh, hopefully they will uh, uh, avoid going down that path in the future. I don't know if they'll reform or not, uh, but we base ourselves you know, on, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the ideology of gender equality, full inclusion. We don't go for the right-wing explanations uh, uh, that some of these, uh, some of the eco-socialists seem to have fallen for. And I think that's uh, uh, you know, one of the strongest points of our party in terms of the, the political, social ideological debates that are going on in this century. Thank you, Kimball. And thank you for the person who asked that question. Uh, let me move to another question from the audience. This, this question is, what would the Communist Party prefer over the CERB? And I'll call on Walt to please address that one. So the, uh, the CERB was paying, <laughs> The CERB. CERB was paying out $2,000 a month, which is the figure that Justin Trudeau figured Canadians needed to survive during the pandemic. So we would double social assistance and disability rates to match that to ensure that the most vulnerable in our society are able to live with dignity. Uh, furthermore, like we believe that uh, a guaranteed annual livable income is something that is desperately needed to ensure that folks can get by. Uh, in, in lieu of CERB, uh, we feel that EI should have been opened up. Uh, there should be like limits on unemployment insurance should be done away with and people should be able to, uh, to collect 90% of their, their earnings um, permanently until they're able to find work, not, not just 26 weeks. Uh, when they are able to access work again, uh, we would ensure that there is a minimum wage of $20, and we would also like to lower the pension, uh, the age of CPP, and uh, to 60, um, ensuring that there would be more work to go around by letting people in their golden years retire with dignity. Um, our push for a four-day four work week or 32-hour work week would ensure, again, that there's more work to go around, that more folks will be able to find meaningful employment. Um, I, I, I think, yeah, I think that's covered it. Uh, there's, there's a lot to be done, but we, we do have a plan. Thanks, Walt. And thank you for the individual who posed that question. Let's move to another one, um, from the chat. This one's a two-parter. So there's a couple of, uh, questions that we pulled out that we see as related. So we'll pose them together. The first one is, can you comment on the RCMP and municipal police forces and their policies, particularly in regards to Indigenous and other minorities? What does that the Communist Party propose about this? And the second question we see as related um, is regarding racism. And since Trump is in power, we have seen the rise of racism in British Columbia. What is this, the stance of the CPC against the rise of racism? So we see a lot of racial issues um, related to the RCMP. So we decided to pose these questions together. And uh, Tyson, can you please uh, answer this one? Okay, so um, <clears throat> to speak to the first part of that question regarding the RCMP, um, I mean, of course the RCMP has a history as a, as a colonial frontier police force. Its, uh, its origins are, are 
fundamentally racist. And I think it still to this day, you know, carries out, uh, you know, carries out extremely racist policies and actions against uh, not only Indigenous people, but other minorities. Uh, the police in Victoria being a perfect example who have had multiple reports as being one of the most racist police forces uh, in the province. Um, and, and, you know, here in Victoria, uh, we see, uh, I think, serious uh, over-reliance on police to deal with, uh, well, issues the police shouldn't be dealing with at all in terms of homelessness, addiction, um, mental health, uh, and I think a, a really good example of, of you know, why police shouldn't de be dealing with this is, uh, is, is, uh, is seen clearly in the tragedy of, of uh, Regis Korczynski Paquette, uh, the 29 year old black indigenous woman in uh, Montreal, or is it, oh geez, Montreal or Toronto, I'm forgetting now, uh, who, was, uh, who was pushed from her balcony during a wellness check by police. Uh, uh, leading to her her death, which is which is a horrifying and unacceptable, I think, uh, some uh, tragedy uh, and a horrible tragedy to have happen, completely unnecessary. Our party is in favor of defunding police and trans uh, transferring a lot of that funding towards uh, things that can actually help working class people: mental health uh, funding, uh, health care, school, uh, the works. But um, that said, uh, you know, we recognize that, that police serve, serve a function in capitalist society. They serve a function in upholding, uh, you know, the ruling class, the status quo, property rights, protecting the property of the bourgeoisie uh, and maintaining the capitalist state. Uh, and as such, you know, like uh, without ultimately overthrowing capitalism, we're still going to have the underlying class antagonisms that lead to these issues with policing. Uh, so, like I say, ultimately, the, the only solution will, the final solution uh, lies not just in defunding but police, but in, in, in overthrowing capitalism and replacing it with a, with a socialist society. Uh, now, there was a second, second part to that question. Um, am I able to get a reminder? Yes, of course. Um, I'll repeat this part. So, since Trump is in power, we've seen the rise of racism in British Columbia. What is the stance of the CPC against the rise of racism? Certainly. Um, <clears throat> uh, first, I would point out, however, uh, racism was rising in BC before and in Canada before Trump was elected. And, and this is something that I was talking about uh, the first time I ran in a, in a federal election in 2015. Um, I was talking about the, the dangers uh, posed by these, these, these organizations. Now, um, to imagine that this is just a result of Trump misses the fact that, you know, uh, far right fascist uh, and white supremacist organizations in Canada have close ties with, uh, with some of the highest ranking uh, members of our government, you know, members of the Conservative Party, for example, members of the People's Party. They all have prominent positions in, in media, which has, again, connections to to, to much bigger sources of funding from the bourgeoisie and from corporations who have an interest in, in pushing these reactionary racist ideas. Why? Why? Capitalism relies on racism. Racism uh, creates a group of hyper-exploited people who, who uh, are in a less of a position to, to demand equal wages, demand equal rights, and, and consequently uh, they're used as a scapegoat moreover and, and uh, end up taking the the uh, brunt of working class people's anger when they, they feel the squeeze, uh, right? I mean, what we have in Canada now is we have uh, an economic crisis that's inherent to capitalism. And, and when people uh, are, in, in, are insecure and they feel that their jobs and their livelihoods are at risk, uh, they've been encouraged to blame China. They've been encouraged to blame indigenous people. They've been encouraged to, to, take, uh, to blame immigrants and migrant workers, and, and frankly, some of the most vulnerable groups in our society, rather than uh, directing their, their anger towards the bourgeoisie and the big corporations who, who, who cause these problems. So if, if anyone is under the illusions that uh, racism is going to go away with, with the election of another president in the United States, I, I'm afraid that's, that you're, <laughs> that's very wishful thinking. Uh, our party has always stood firmly against racism. And as, we, as I say, we have a 
we have an understanding of racism. We have a theoretical understanding of racism as, as something rooted and inherent to capitalism. Um, I, I don't think any other party works as hard uh, to educate its members on, on what racism is and how it works and, and, and how we can ultimately get rid of it. And however, I think there's a lot of socialist societies that have made incredible progress on this question and we need to be looking to them for examples. Um, so as I say, uh, you know, uh, these are big problems, but one thing we could really easily do is, is ban hate organizations like the KKK, like the Proud Boys uh, and, and others who practice again, these <laughs> or promote these hateful, hateful views. Thanks. Thanks, Tyson, for answering that. And thank you to the person who posed this question. Um, we are going to go to our last question from the audience. Um, we wish we could answer them all, but we don't want to keep you too long. But we have noted everyone's questions and we will try our best to respond to them in other ways, whether it's through social media posts or through um, our press. Um, but please keep an eye out uh, so that all questions will eventually be answered in other ways. So our last question is, how would the Communist Party support a significant increase in supportive housing, not just affordable housing, supportive housing for folks who need assistance? And I'll call on Ryan to please answer this one. Sorry, would you mind uh, repeating the question? Sure, no problem. Would the Communist Party support a significant increase in supportive housing? not just affordable housing, supportive housing for folks who need assistance. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea of what's affordable housing in Vancouver and, and Toronto and, you know, pretty much every city in this country is, you know, it's $2,000 a month for a one bedroom apartment. It's $2,500 a month for a one bedroom apartment. So, I mean, what's, what's considered affordable in the first place is, is a very generous term that's used by the bourgeois media and by politicians to make it look like they're putting forward all these housing solutions to uh, tenants who are, you know, feeling the squeeze of rent or people forced forced out on the streets. So, um, yeah, we we propose social housing, uh, publicly owned housing um, that doesn't put, you know doesn't put the, the rents back into uh, private developers, doesn't send it into, you know, multinational corporations, doesn't send it into, uh, you know, tax havens overseas. Like we propose social housing as a way of uh, making sure that your income isn't being completely, you know, dwarfed by the cost of rent, making sure that it's a, it's a reasonable percentage of your rent or of your wages rather. Um, and that basically that money is put back into the local economy, so. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you. Oh, yeah, it's on, okay. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you to everybody who uh, asked questions in the chat. Again, we hope to answer them all perhaps through our press or online, so keep an eye out. Um, at this moment, we're kind of at the end. We're getting towards our closing remarks here. So I want to give um, each candidate an opportunity uh, to speak a little bit more. So at this moment, we have already spoken a lot about the most urgent issues affecting British Columbians today. But what is unique about the Communist Party is that we also look towards the long-term goal of building socialism. So I wanna ask each candidate to speak to their perspective of what it means to build socialism in Canada today and what this long-term vision entails. I'll start with Kimball to please answer this question. Okay, uh, well, I don't wanna take uh, uh, a lot of time here because we are close to the end. When I think of socialism in this context, uh, you know, I, I look at my situation. I'm the oldest of our five candidates in BC in this election. And my thoughts naturally turn to, you know, what kind of society uh, guarantees uh, everybody from senior citizens like myself to our children who may have, you know, in, in my case, a son with some handicaps uh, to ordinary working people, 
uh, struggling to survive? What kind of society can we have that guarantees uh, that our interests will be put first? Not always looking for what will be profitable for the big corporations, what will be good for the condo market, what will be good for the stock market. No, we need a society that says we count, our interests count. We need a society that says it's not uh, the big energy companies that count, it's the natural environment we all have to live in. And you can't have a society like that, frankly, as long as the dominant economic interest is big capital, as long as all the decisions are made in the interests of profitability. That's a society that will destroy this planet. So we need to move to a society uh, where the natural environment, the resources, the productive wealth that, the, that we create, these things are owned and democratically controlled by all of us so that we can have a real safe and secure future. And, and that's socialism. We aren't afraid to say, you know, we're not just against capitalism, we're in favor of something. We're in favor of a socialist future, a, a future that, uh, you know, everyone in this planet could enjoy. Thank you, Kimball. Let's move to Ryan for similar for the same question. Sure. I mean, uh, I guess I'd like to talk about you know capitalism. People like to frame it these days as this, oh, it's this debate between capitalism or socialism, or or like as if it's some some sort of like philosophical or moral uh, debate. But uh, you know, the harsh reality is is that capitalism, capitalism does have an expiry date. You know, you, you see over the past four or 500 years, you know, these massive productive forces, you know, we call them, you know, where, you know, cities are built, you know, huge uh, industrial sectors are built up, uh, monies and capital is exported all throughout the planet. It's colonized the world and every colonized, you know, country undergoes, you know, a similar process um, of, you know, these productive forces being built. This is done through immen immense violence, um, but the reality is, you know, that is, that's the moment we're at right now. Um, capitalism, it has, you know, a fatal flaw to it, and that is, you know, the falling rate of profit. You know, it's, capitalism thrives and actually grows and expands um, through the exploitation of the labor of the working class. Um, and this is what, you know, this is what builds up capital. Um, the problem is, is that all these capitalists are always competing. They're always trying to get, you know, the upper hand, trying to outmaneuver and monopolize and corner markets. Um, and they bring in mechanization, they bring in automation and, you know, as a way of cutting costs. The problem is, is that this uh, pushes the workers that they exploit out of the workforce. You know, this is a crunch we're feeling in BC right now, where, you know, automation is one of the biggest threats to the working class um, if it continues under capitalism. Um, and basically, all the while this is going on, profits continue to fall because there's no more labor to exploit or less and less labor to exploit. And so there's a lot of mythology, you know, economic mythology, you know, big bankers, uh, you know, corporate talking heads on the news. They're all talking about this V-shaped recovery of this bounce back from COVID. It's not going to happen. It is absolutely not going to happen. What, can, what we can continue to expect under capitalism is more austerity, ecocide, fascism, and war. Or, you know, the destruction of these productive forces. So for me, it's, it's not a question of, oh, you know, what's better, capitalism or socialism? You know, it's an economic reality. We're facing either socialism or extinction. And that's, you know, that's my take on it. Thank you, Ryan. Same question to Walt, please. Hi, right, thanks. So for me, to, to build socialism is to build a society where no one wonders where they will sleep for the night or when their next meal will be, uh, where people can work fewer hours and take home more pay, where the government recognizes the innate value in every human being and gives them the tools that they need to be the best one that they can be. Uh, a society where climate change, the fight against climate change is waged like a war 
where the environment is preserved in its beauty for future generations, where the threat of automation becomes a collective weight off of people's shoulders, where people have time to work on themselves and build relationships and to get involved in their community and to make a future that works in the interest of everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Walt. And Tyson, la uh, uh, our last person to answer this question. Certainly, and it's, uh, it's certainly very difficult following up such articulate comrades. One excellent thing about being in the Communist Party. Uh, but uh, that said, uh, I, I will say in brief that for me, socialism is about making democracy real. Uh, you know, there's so many people today who will, and this was quite a deliberate, uh, you know, something that happened during the Cold War, this conflation of, of democracy with capitalism. But in fact, the truth is that democracy and capitalism are, are antagonistic. They're in contradiction and you, you can't have both, uh, you know, under capitalism, uh, ultimately decisions are, are, are bought and sold, uh, even, you know, elections. Here, we're running this election in BC and, and uh, to, <laughs> it's not even comparable what sort of budget we have to, to the big business parties. And of course not, we're a, we're a working class party, uh, whereas these parties are supported by, by big corporations and moneyed interests who, who, uh, who make every effort, uh, not just through, through lobbying, you know, to influence democracy, but through other indirect means as well. Uh, capitalism is a complete system, and there's there's a hundred different levers uh, on the economy, uh, which which give corporations and the rich control over over decisions and legislation that uh, is made, uh, you know, uh, ostensibly democratically, but in, in reality, uh, that's not the case. So for for me, socialism is is absolutely um, synonymous with with democracy and and making the promises of democracy real for everyone. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Tyson. And thank you all. Um, thank you all for your answers. Thank you to the people who posed questions, our community members who uh, came on this call, to everyone who tuned in. And to round off this great discussion, we'll now go to our short campaign video just to get to know our candidates and our politics a little bit more. Premier John Horgan's snap election during the rising wave of COVID-19 cases places partisan interests ahead of health and safety. The people of British Columbia deserve better. In this campaign, we urge voters to demand fundamental social change. Electing even one communist to legislature would transform the political terrain. A higher vote for communist candidates can send a powerful message that working class and poor voters, indigenous people and environmentalists, all those who reject the capitalist mantra of unending profits refuse to be taken for granted any longer. Our world today faces an impending climate catastrophe, a huge gap between rich and poor, and unending imperialist wars and regime change. As capitalism staggers from crisis to crisis, far-right forces are promoting a tidal wave of racism, police brutality, scapegoating of immigrants, misogyny, homophobia, and transphobia. Whenever the emergency measures to help people survive the pandemic come to an end, the working class will be forced to pay the cost for bailing out the business sector. Nobody wants a return to the corporate BC Liberals. They should be defeated in this election. But the hope that people had when the NDP Green Coalition government took office has largely not been carried out. They've failed to keep the promises for real change in this province. It's true, there are some things that were accomplished under Horgan's government. Higher minimum wage, higher disability and social assistance rates. There was money put into childcare and housing, but none of it went nearly far enough to address the serious economic challenges that people in this province are facing, especially during the economic crisis around the COVID epidemic. We need to tax the rich to use that money to really implement fundamental change in this province. We need child care now, not 10 years from now. We need housing to end the crisis of street homelessness now, not years from now. 
We need higher minimum wages now, not four, five, six years down the road. These are things that can be really done right now, right today, but the government has not earned our votes with its record over the last three years. The NDP says it lacks the revenue base to make more rapid progress on homelessness, health care, public education, and child care. But the Premier and his cabinet have never considered cancelling the multi-billion dollar liberal tax cuts for corporations and the top income earners. Instead of decisive steps to cut greenhouse gas emissions, the NDP has continued the construction of the Site C Dam. The NDP gave huge tax breaks for the planned LNG terminal at Kitimat. And the Premier supported sending in the RCMP against land defenders uh, who were resisting the coastal gas link pipeline across unceded Wet'suwet'en territories. Bill 41 promised to fully implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. But the NDP backs resource extraction and export megaprojects. These are not the actions of a government which supports the life and death struggle for climate justice. By failing to challenge the source of corporate power, Horgan's NDP has not earned the trust of the working class. It does not deserve our votes, especially in ridings where communists are on the ballot. We campaign for policies to weaken corporate power, protect the environment, and defend the interests of the working class and indigenous peoples. Only socialism, based on democratic public ownership of the economy and the political power of the working class, can offer a genuine solution to the complex problems confronting BC and indeed our country and our world. I'm Walter Parsons, and I'm the candidate for Victoria Swan Lake for the Communist Party of British Columbia. I'm Brian Castle, and I'm running in Oak Bay Gordon Head for the Communist Party of BC. Hi, my name is Kimball Carrier. I'm a candidate in the riding of Vancouver Hastings for the Communist Party of BC. My name is Tyson Strandland. I'm running in the riding of Langford Juan de Fuca for the Communist Party of British Columbia. My name is Ryan Abbott. I'm running in Surrey Wally for the Communist Party of BC. Okay, thank you everyone. And I just wanna say, you know, one more big uh, thank you for everyone who came out tonight to see what the CPCBC is all about. Again, we are asking you to vote for our candidates if you are in a position to do so and to support our party as socialist ideas become more popular all over. There's the People's Voice, Canada's socialist newspaper where you can learn more about our party and our party website is cpcbc.ca, where you can learn more and apply to join if that's something you're interested in. Our party next year will be celebrating our, its centenary, so 100 years of struggle for socialism in Canada. And so if you're interested in, in that or in learning more in general, you can follow our social media. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. Um, and we hope that you keep tuning into our events because we're very grateful that you've been here. So thanks again. <laughs>